Hey folks, welcome back to another Field and Garden podcast. It is your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and thanks so much for hitting the play button. I know you have a lot of choices and we always appreciate every listener. And um, so thanks for dropping in. And today I have um, a really great lineup here. Um, I am here with good friends, Steve and Gretel Adams of Sunny Meadows Flower Farm. Hi guys. Hi. How you doing? Thanks for having us. Oh, yes. Thank you guys so much. I know that your season is already up and running. So I really appreciate you being here with us. So before we dive in, folks, if you're new to us um, and you want to learn about the work that the Gardeners Workshop is doing, head on over to the gardenersworkshop.com. We have we're an online learning center as well as we have an online garden shop and we have so many resources. We have free ones. We have a more um, comprehensive courses that you can purchase, whether you're a home gardener or somebody that is interested in starting a flower-based business, flower farming, farmer florist, florist that wants to go local, we got you covered. So head on over there and check that out. And I've asked Steve and, Steve and Gretel today to share with us about a crop that, and I'll be honest, y'all, I have never grown them because I'm a, you know, I'm an old field farmer here in the middle of the city with no structures. And so I just never dipped my toe into ranunculus and anemones. And so I have asked them one here today to kind of tell us about, you know, growing them, what it takes and what their experience has been. And um, hopefully this will just be some basics, friends, to kind of whet your appetite that maybe you want to go there. So would you say, guys, that ranunculus is like the star of spring? Is that a is that a fair assumption? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. It's definitely the the top crop for us. And I think, you know, anemones kind of get overshadowed by ranunculus just because it's so beautiful and everybody loves it. But I love anemones just as much. But ranunculus is in the, our top five crops yeah ranunculus in the spring mm -hmm. lizzie's in the summer and dahlia's in the fall so you know i remembered on one of our conversations somewhere that kind of like i seem like i remember you guys saying that ranunculus are kind of what fueled y'all to add more houses so you mm -hmm. can grow more ranunculus right mm -hmm. yeah uh, and so, we grow heated and unheated so that it helps like spread the season out too uh, i mean that's that these are the kinds of things that people need to know about, you know? Mm -hmm. All right. So first let's start off by when is, I know that we're, we're talking, it's like the end of March and they haven't started yet or have they? Yeah. Ours, yeah. The ones in the heated house have started. Um, last week was our first big harvest week. We had some the week before, but we kind of time it so that that's blooms start in March, like our, the pre-chilled tulips, ranunculus anemones we all kind of want to come on at the same time it makes it easier for sales when you have more than one item happening oh, that's that's a really good point so um my first question um is when would a person when should a person order ranunculus and anemone corn what is their official name are they corms bulbs tubers what are they they call them corms, but I, I think they're actually officially a tuber because they need a center. Yeah, the ranunculus. They need a piece of the crown in the center, like a tuber does. But they've always been called corms, as far as as I know in the in the um, industry. But as far as like when's the best time to buy them, man? I feel like that just keeps getting pushed sooner, earlier, and earlier and earlier with all bulb crops, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it used to be that we would harvest or we would put in our order for our tulips when we were harvesting our tulips. This year we had to put in our order for our tulips when we we're planting our tulips, you know? Wow. And so just to, I mean, that's a little early, but just to kind of make sure we were mm -hmm. um, ahead because of, you know, so much demand for these things now that, that sometimes it can be hard to get. Um, so we've got like some, some orders are already in for next year. Cause some stuff is like selling out and then, and your orders might change based on, you know, what their harvest is like of the crop. Cause they're also like, you know, giving out the availability lists based on what they project that they're going to harvest. So if it ends up being, they have a bad year, or there's a crop failure or something, there might be changes, but 
Um, Just like all of us, you know, dealing with the weather, they could have bad weather and it could really exactly. mess up the whole crop, um, you know, over more overcast days, more rainy days. Yeah. Stuff like that. So it used to be like if you got your ranunculus order in, in June, it was early. Um, now I think, yeah, June might be late to get some of like the varieties. So it's happening so, fast. So, so talk, talk to your sales rep. You know, your sales rep will be able to um, kind of let you know that things are running out. Once you build up a good relationship with a sales rep, you know, they know kind of what you get on a yearly basis. So the good ones will reach out to us and be like, hey, just so you know, I'm getting, I'm starting to get some orders in for this stuff. We might want to get your order in before yeah. it sells out. So building that relationship with a sales rep at whatever bulb company you're using, um, I think yeah. helps. So you've said several things there that just make me want to highlight them, especially because, you know, we know that flower farmers are listening. First off, people don't understand how their orders can be changed, well, how that happens. You know, you place your order a year in advance and then lo and behold, it doesn't come to pass. And, you know, that's the thing about being a farmer, right? I mean, just as our crops are totally dependent on, we're at the mercy of the weather and everything. So are the people producing these crops that we're trying to buy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing if, let's say a florist wanted to put in an order a year ahead of time for these crops, you know, and we don't, most people wouldn't do that because right. we don't have that much control. Right. And so we're a little bit more, um, conservative conservative on, on that but but let's say a florist put in an order and then you could only get three of the 10 bunches that they wanted of that color because of the weather you know it's kind of the same thing that we're putting in orders a year in advance for bulbs and yeah. a, lot, a lot can go wrong and the other thing that you said that I want to highlight is building a relationship with the sales rep I understand. I mean, that's about chemistry. That's about good service. That's about you being a good customer. All those things really work together. And I understand new people, you know, jumping from company to company and price shopping because you don't really understand sometimes this big picture. But what you just shared makes finding who you want to work with and sticking with them um, really, really important. Right. And I mean, and I know so y'all have been at this for how many years now? This is 16, year 16 for us. Oh yeah. my gosh. <sighs> but to touch, <laughs> to touch on that sales rep stuff like, too, <sighs> I know this isn't the point of the podcast, but it's important, I think too, is um, finding that I'm pretty picky about my sales reps. You know, I don't want someone that's pushy or somebody that um, kind of belittles me a little, or, you know, put, you know, kind of makes me feel stupid or I feel stupid when I talk to them. So I'm really picky about sales rep. I don't like, I don't like the um, the shows at, at conferences where you talk around, walk around, and talk to different reps. Except I'll go if to the people ones. People are very yeah. People, yeah, some folks can be a little more pushy than others. Yeah, so I'm pretty picky. Or they about don't it. know. They don't always know about cut flowers either. So that's something else that's, you know, like um, now that now that ball is Glockner or whatever, it's like building that relationship with a new sales rep and him kind of getting an understanding of what our business does. Right. Yeah. So it's two-sided, you know, you have to really find that right person and make a go of it. So, so I guess I should also say here, um, so when do you normally plant ranunculus? And if, then if you're planting that, and so if you're saying order in June, so when would you be planting those? that fall we start yeah we start starting them we start them in trays soak them and put them in 72s for four weeks um before we plant them out just to like pre-sprout them and so we start starting them in october and then i think we have six different successions and then each succession is also split between heated and unheated so that it kind of helps start right. plantings and so we did our final seeding of ranunculus two weeks ago, which would have been the second week in March. Yeah. Or the first week in March, somewhere yeah. around there. Week 11, I yeah, think is the last. Last week? Yeah. So you start in the fall and plant through winter? Is that what yeah. you're saying? Mm -hmm. And plant through, plant through spring almost. Yeah. You know, the last, the last succession isn't going to be, the last succession is going to be the worst succession, but it kind of helps. Right. 
we have other crops coming on at that time that we can use them in bouquets. And so that's when our bouquet program really starts is when we start getting the small, shorter ranunculus. All right. Yeah. So ordering these babies, you're saying that in a normal time, June used to be like the go-to time, but now back in that date up is beneficial when you can. Yeah. You I mean, otherwise, like there's still stuff that's on the availability list, but you just might not get all the colors that you want. So I know like some of the you know, like salmon and um, tends to sell out or some of the like uh, blushy ones like Rosa Chiaro and Pastello and things like that. So, um, okay. Yeah. All those, all those soft wedding colors. Sure. And so are there sizes of the corms or you mean, is that like it is in peonies and bulbs? Is it the same? Yeah, so you can buy small ones or big ones. Um, we tend to go for like the three fours is what we're looking for, um, just because the the bigger ones can be a little bit more expensive. And so they say that the bigger ones you get more stems out of them. Um, and but we haven't necessarily run trials to exactly like quantify that. Right. So the two threes are a smaller corm and they're going to give you fewer stems um but that is actually what the size that they use the guy from awnings told me that that's the size that they use for like the huge japanese ones where they kind of disbud the side buds to get that like that really big bud right it's fewer stems it's putting more energy into the stems that they have so but for our goal we want you know more stems that are a nice medium size head so three fours or four fives just depends on what is available um on the list yeah and so as a beginner grower are all the varieties equal or are there some that you would recommend beginners to start with you know i mean i don't know if they are there some that are more disease prone or you know that type of thing is is there a favorite that you would recommend for beginners we are finding that there are varieties that are definitely disease prone. Um, or like have really bad germination, yeah. and like rotten flat and stuff. So, so there are some that, that we're kind of leaning away from, um, but are there varieties? Yeah, I mean, if you're starting, I would like the, the Elegance from Awnings, um, that series has a lot of good ones in it. Um, the Malva is the one we're talking about. That's been really bad for us lately. Um, but I think that they actually discontinued that color probably, that's probably, probably for that reason. Um, the Tecalote varieties are good, good place to start because the corms are cheap and those you can get from Leo Burby. Um, they actually, they come from a California grower and they grow them outside. So I think that's maybe why they're a little bit cheaper than some of the, um, Italian. The, the Italian or the Dutch ones mm. or, and those are a little bit more open face. So you can kind of see the center. So they're a little bit more like, um, ranunculus, like if ranunculus and poppies, like had a baby is kind of what it looks like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then from <laughs> from um, Ball or Edney, like we like the Amandine. I think you know Labelle works too. But the Amandine, I like some of the colors that they have, like uh, like the pastelli ones and stuff. So there's multiple options from multiple like suppliers. But if I would start with the cheaper ones, honestly, if you're just starting out, so you can kind of figure out your systems that's, and planting data. Because um, there are ones out there that are really nice that are but they're two dollars a corn but it's like you kind of need to know that you can charge enough to like make up for the cost of the corn if you're going to grow the specialty ones so what about anemones what do you have any favorites there um yeah the the panda anemone is the one that sells the most for us the white with the black center i think just because it's like different than others um and then, yeah, I mean, people like the wine and the purples and the pinks. So I think really in the spring that people are just excited for flowers. So we um, just opened the farm stand this past weekend and yeah, sold more anemones to retail folks than we usually do. So I don't know if, you know, people are finally catching on that they're, that they're really cool too, but we like um, the anemones. There's a pastel one also that's kind of a mix that we like. Um, so we don't usually plant a lot of mixes, but if there's like a pastel mix, we'll just kind of sell it that way and not sell it by this specific color. 
All right. So the big question I'm sure going through, you know, people's minds that have never gone down this road before is, do you have to grow them in a tunnel? Are they too risky out in the field? Is it a lot of work if you wanted to grow them out in the field? What's the, what's your basic advice or recommendation there? We have tried them out in the field multiple times. Um, we've never overwintered them out in the field because I don't think that, I don't know if that would work, but what we would do is plant them in the spring. And then um, by the time they flowered, they were flowering, you know, six inches tall. And I think because we had to wait until the soil was dry before we could get in to prep the bed to plant them outside, um, that it was too late at that point for them to really get any growth. Wow. It was already too warm. Um, so I think if you live in an area where you can get in the ground early, um, then I think it is doable. I mean, obviously it's doable in California. Um, right. And so it's definitely doable outside, but you just, just like any other crop, you grow it in a high tunnel or a greenhouse, uh, the, everything's going to be bigger. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in our, in the end, we had that one patch that kind of worked, but then it rained on it. And then it, we had some really hot days in May. And so it just kind of like burnt all the tips. So for all of like the work that goes into it and the cost and stuff, we would suggest under undercover. And also it's during rainy season that you're growing this crop outside. And let's yeah. say you're trying to grow a white ranunculus. It's already not that tall. And then we just get it, you know, uh, April rain, um, it could really do some damage. It's a lot different than if we were trying to do it in the summer when you might not get that much rain. And so basically what I'm hearing is it could be possible, but mm -hmm. it's not likely. And particularly if you're a beginner, you know, you add that on top of it, unlike being at least an experienced person and you knowing how to tweak. And so the recommendation is, is that they need to be under poly of some kind, whether that's, I know that Jenny Love, I think, had grow, has grown them out in the field under a low poly tunnel, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a low I'm poly sure. tunnel is a lot of work too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly kind of what you said, having experience and knowing these tricks that you can do, you know, you could silage tarp a field and keep it uh, dry, you know, and take it off during warm days, put it on if it's going to rain to kind of dry out. There's little things you can do for sure to experiment and um, have some success. Yeah. yeah. But try, you know, try, try, yeah, trials sometimes can, they're a trial and sometimes they don't always work out. All right, so what is the, I know that I've heard, I just saw Dave Dowling answering somebody yesterday um, about temperatures, about when it heats up, what happens to ranunculus and anemones when it gets, if you plant too late or it just gets unseasonably warm or hot, what happens? Yeah, so it's a cool weather crop, so it does not like it hot. So that's why for us, we're zone 5B, 6A-ish, um, and it gets too hot by the end of May. So I know that there are some growers that can have it, you know, a lot longer in the season, but for us, we typically get some hot days in May that kind of will like shut the ranunculus down. Um, so if we have any after Mother's Day, then it's kind of like we get a bonus couple weeks sometimes, and then mm -hmm. they're usually done by the end of May. So um, if you get really hot in the spring, then the planting dates, you know, would probably be sooner. So that way they're blooming they're blooming by the time it's that hot in the season. So they're going to naturally shut down and go dormant and like, you know, put that energy back into the corms um, to kind of like prepare themselves for next year once it gets hot. So the plants will start to sort of like shut down and die back. You know, and I think I saw yesterday, um, Jenny Love of Love and Fresh was putting shade cloth on her houses for mm -hmm. this very reason. She's already getting too hot she was afraid that they would just shut down I guess mm -hmm. you know and do what you just spoke of so that's another really great point to think about you have to be on your game meaning planting in a timely fashion to really mm -hmm. make this work right mm -hmm. and we talk about in our class too like a lot about ventilation as like a really important greenhouse management thing so like for us you know, we're venting the sides and opening the doors and like getting cooler air in there. So you don't want it to be like really hot during the day and then still going to be like 25 at night. 
So it's like, even in the colder months, you're still trying to like keep that house cooler so that you don't have such like a big temperature swing. Cause you don't want it to be warm enough to activate a lot of green growth. And then you still have some really cold days. You'd rather it grow like low and slow and stay cold and then like activate when it's actually time for it in spring. Telling you, it's what we don't know, right? All right, let's just talk about grow, how planting them. Um, so, so we know you're growing them in houses. So do you grow them in, do y'all use film or landscape cloth or are they open beds? What is your planting situation inside your houses that you're planting them in? So um, during the winter cycle of greenhouse crops, uh, we do raised beds. And so in the fall, when we're prepping the beds, we dig out the walkways to make a artificial raised bed um, in the greenhouse. And this helps with days where you get, a, you know, you have a lot of snow and it melts, you get a lot of rain or just like higher water table. And then we're planting them directly into the bed. So no film, no plastic, um, six rows every six inches apart with a um, 18 to 20 inch walk wire and then six rows every six inches and so on and so forth. All right, so do you once they, so what's their watering kind of need? I would guess that you're in raised beds, um, irrigation for sure, right? And th so how often in a normal environment, assuming it's not raining for 80 days outside and making a real mm -hmm. humid situation, what would your watering schedule be for that? Um, when we are December, January here, we're really cloudy. We might see the sun three days a month, four days a month. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of that, the plants aren't transpiring or anything. So I'm watering maybe once a month, maybe on that sunny day. You know, if it's, if it's going to be sunny for two days in a row, I'll water for an hour, you know, a whole okay. 30 by 96 house water for an hour. And then now, you know, it's spring, we're getting a lot more sun. Um, I'm either watering um, once or twice a week for an hour um, or some houses I water for like 10 minutes a day in the morning or something like that. I have them on a timer. You just don't want them to stay wet. They'll rot, especially when you're pre-sprouting them. You put them in a tray. For us, we put them in a tray. Some people pre-sprout them in the cooler, but we put them in a tray and we water them. And then you don't really want to water them that much until they sprout. So those, those corms will mold and like rot. They kind of like turn to snot if they're but too, you also, too wet. You also don't want them to dry out either. Yeah. So, so, you know, I mean, we keep ranunculus a little bit on the wetter side than, than some other crops, um, you know, but. Experience is what is screaming here, right? I mean, you kind of figure it out as you go and screw it up, I'm sure. And then you know better for next time. But yeah. so it just kind of sounds like you really have to gauge your environment, which is what I really want people to kind of, there is no black and white answers for any of this, right? Yeah. I mean, it's all right. Yeah. And so I want to say before we move on, um, Gretel has created a great PDF um, about this, what we're talking about today, ranunculus and anemones. And I'm going to put in the show notes below where you can request that, um, folks, if you would like. So do you have to net ranunculus? We don't. We okay. don't. Sometimes I, I wonder if we should. Um, for the earlier ones, they get a little bit more tall. It becomes kind of, of a jungle through the walkway. Um, but we don't net it. We try and put as little labor into it as possible. I hear you. So what would you, if I would say to you, so in with ranunculus and anemones, what pest and disease issues pop into your mind when I say those? Aphids. Yeah, <laughs> that's the biggest issue is that the, right when they're starting to bud up and like bloom is when it's like prime aphid time in the greenhouse. So they get a green peach aphids. So they start out on the underside of the leaves, but they'll also be all over the buds. Same with anemones. So like, if you don't, we use beneficial insects. And then also like, if we see an aphid issue, the most important time to scout 
is like right before they're going to bloom, like when they've got buds on them, because if they're open flowers and you spray them, then you're going to damage the flowers. So you want to like, if there, something needs to happen, it needs to kind of happen when they're still in those earlier stages. Or if we need to deal with aphids, like after that, or powdery mildew sometimes happens too. Yeah. Um, then we'll go through and harvest really hard, like harvest ones that, you know, are still really tight, but just to like get those out of there before you spray um, so that you're not damaging any of like the future blooms. So, and with powdery mildew, we've found it's the, the one that attached. So powdery mildew is like host specific most of the time, but there are some that are more general. And the one that lives on dahlias also lives on ranunculus. So we've learned to not like over, um, we don't want to overwinter or we don't want to have our late like Thanksgiving dahlias in the same house where we're trying to have our early ranunculus. Like we don't want those plants in the greenhouse at the same time. And also with ranunculus and powdery mildew, you know, what happens is it is on the oldest crop and that's where we're, you know, we go harvest that every morning first, that, that crop. And then new crops come on in different houses and uh, they harvest with you. They yeah, they harvest that powdery mildew and then they're just moving it through the houses. Um, yeah. and so, so so we also sanitize like once we start having issues, we'll put spray bottles of sanitizer in the houses so that way they can like spray their snips. And you know, if they've got a big like arm load, kind of like spray their arm and stuff, spray their legs so that way they're not like carrying it from house to house. That is such a great tip. All right. So that brings me to the next question is what stage do you harvest anemones? Um, so the anemones are a little bit more challenging because they, uh, they close at night. So I think when you're learning harvesting on a sunny day is a good idea. So you can kind of see which ones are fully open. So they sort of like will open and close. And as they move up, as their collar moves up away from the foliage, um, then the, the petals get bigger. So you want to get them, they get a pollen ring kind of like um, sunflowers do. Like you want to get them before that like pollen starts to develop. And okay. once the petals have, have fully developed. Um, let me ask you this, when y'all are, so what about ranunculus stage to harvest? So you can harvest it pretty tight or you can harvest it more open. It just depends on how fast you're trying to sell it. You know, like if you harvest it really tight, then you can store it for a little bit longer or for the customer, it might last two weeks in a vase. Like if you harvest it open, it might only be, you know, five to seven days or something like that. Like if it's fully blown out. So there is a two open, you know, as far as, unless you're like using it for a wedding and it's okay if it like falls apart the next day, but I think I, it's kind of like a soft marshmallow yeah. stage, almost like a peony would be where it's like, once it starts, once those petals are developed and they kind of start to loosen in that tight ball, then, yeah. then it's harvestable. I think it's, all about your sales outlet who's your who's the next customer you're selling it to and that would determine kind of what stage you harvest it at yeah because retail people i feel like want them a little bit more open whereas florists want them closed yeah. um so that they can store them for a little bit longer or if they're for a mm -hmm. wedding and they're not picking up until thursday and their wedding's on saturday then they're probably going to want them like pretty open you know so we try to like talk about that with our florist of like you know some of them are like the ranunculus is harvested tight. So if you have a weekend event to, you know, put in your order for earlier in the week, so that way you can let them like open in time. That's a great point. And I want to point out two things. One is what you just said, as the grower flower farmer, we don't open flowers for customers. Mm -hmm. We advise them on what you just said, right? I mean, that mm -hmm. is, I mean, I hear of people oftentimes trying to do that, that are selling wholesale. I'm not talking about doing an event as a farmer florist. I'm talking about if you're selling to commercial customers, they get the flowers to the stage that they want it in and buy it from you at the time to be able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. And so my, well, that kind of leads me into the next question is who buys ranunculus and anemones and um, florist designers supermarkets farmers markets subscriptions all of the above or do you find it across the board or what 
Yeah, yeah. Um, for the most part, everybody. I mean, like right now, the heated ranunculus is too expensive for the grocery stores. So like, as far as how our business is set up is, you know, we start selling to florists, then retail, and then like, then grocery stores kind of come after that. Yeah. So for us, grocery stores don't usually start until outdoor tulips happen, which is typically April-ish. And then some of the unheated ranunculus comes on and kind of like our stock and snaps will have like, you know, singles or seconds or whatever, and that goes into our bouquets. So, and, so right yeah. now it's mainly flor florists and retail. Yeah, our bouquet but program. But everybody doesn't... will buy it. Though. Yeah. Anybody, whoever your customer is, will buy ranunculus. So, with you saying, so for those folks that might not quite get the gist of what we're saying, those ranunculus that are blooming early in the season have been living in a heated, meaning propane or natural gas better known as dollar bills, keeping mm -hmm. them warm for a long period of time. So obviously your input is higher. So you have to charge more. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, just y'all are just such a wealth of information. So mm -hmm. let's just try to um, wrap this up for our basics. So what would you say, maybe you can't, what are the hottest selling colors? Um, well, I think it also depends on what your market is. So like, you know, white and like blush and salmon for, for wedding stuff. But what's happening right now is we planted all the white for the weddings and it's a little early and there aren't events yet. And now like retail people don't want to buy all white. They want more color. So naturally it kind of depends on your market. Um, like we like to have, you know, like a light pink, something that's salmon white, we grow butterfly ranunculus too. So that is like kind of the light pink color um, because we're selling mostly to florists. So like, and then our, the unheated ranunculus is more like that's kind of what's blooming for Mother's Day. We want bright as much color as we possibly can. So hot lots pink, of pinks, orange, yeah, yellow. Hot pink, yellow. Because I love the dark ones, but what we found like the viola and stuff is that like, it's either for events or, you know, there's some moms like dark stuff, but for the most part for Mother's Day, we want pinks and yellows and, you know, some of the like softer pastel tones and stuff like that. So plant plant people tend to like the dark stuff, you know, they appreciate unusual. it. Yeah. yeah. But the majority of our customers want, you know, like bright it's spring. So they want something like right. bright. I and totally understand what you're saying. I can remember early yeah. on years growing these very soft, sweet, pastel-y colors, thinking they were so gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And we could not give them away at the farmer's market. You know, people were looking for, they wanted the brighter colors. So I totally understand. So Gretel, I think on the PDF, if you can remember that you made for us to share, um, it has a list of your favorites. And I think it also has some suppliers on it too, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there's also some kind of like growing instructions on the bottom, sort of how we pre-sprout them. Perfect. So we, we so anybody that's interested in the information, um, I will I will put the link in the show notes down below the podcast um, where you can re um, request that. Now, um, you know, I don't want to let them get away from us. First off. Um, I just kind of jumped right in and um, didn't even tell it you all know if you're not familiar with Steve and Gretel of Sunny Meadows Flower Farm. Um, they're going into their 16th year, which I think that they may have already mentioned, but these guys are full time flower farmers. We met through the Association of Specialty Cup Flower Growers um, probably about a decade ago, maybe or so. And um, I was drawn to them. You know, I, I don't grow in houses, so I didn't really always attend their courses that they would be or their um, talks at classes. But I have taken other classes from them, which led me to like have them on our hot list to do an online course with us. And so they were our go-to for growing in hoops and greenhouses. And um, I just want to say that if you are thinking about already growing or not sure what you should do about that whole growing situation, hoop houses and greenhouses, you need to check out their course. Um, you can get on their wait list. It doesn't register until November. And that will also be in the show notes. It's growing cut flower crops in hoop and greenhouses with Gretel and Steve. And if you haven't even 
this was a BB in the Astor Dome of the knowledge rolling around these kids' heads. I call them kids because they're you know, like 30 years younger than me, I think. Um, <laughs> but I'll have all that in the show notes. And so Gretel um, and Steve, tell folks what they might expect to learn about in your course. Yeah, so we it's uh, six weeks long and each week is kind of a different subject. So we start out with like the basics of, you know, what kind of structures there are, location, kind of set of some of the setup, setup, construction, teardown. Um, week two is about like crop planning, decision making, which we kind of talked about some of that here, but being the most expensive real estate and making sure that the right crops are in there. Week three is all about spring crops. So that's where we give like all our planting weeks for ranunculus and all of those details, ranunculus and anemones, stock snaps. Um, week four is about summer. So that's summer into fall. So that's Lizzie's mums. Um, yeah, dahlias for Thanksgiving, all those things about extending the season. Um, week five is about greenhouse management. So we mentioned a little bit about that with the ventilation. So just all the strategies that we've learned of trying to like regulate the temperature and, um, and then week six is all about pest diseases and soil health issues. So, um, there's a lot of details in there and it's all based on things that we learned by doing, learned from mistakes and have kind of gathered the resources. And so, you know, there may be things that you're not growing or things that you, issues that you don't have right now, but this is a good, good reference to be able to go back to it. And, you know, if you, we were told in the beginning, if you think you don't have bugs, you just haven't, they just haven't found you yet, or you don't know what you're looking for one, <laughs> one or the other. So true. But, uh, yeah. But, you know, so we talk about the beneficials that we use and like our scouting practices and stuff like that. Um, yeah, because the first few years when when the farm was in a new spot and the greenhouses were just put up, we didn't have issues. It was like once, yeah, once they, once the pests know that you're there or once you've been growing for a few years and the, you know, diseases and stuff start to like build up in the soil um, and sort of what, what we did about the things that we've encountered. So. And that way you're not caught, um, for lack of a better expression caught with your pants down when it comes to having <laughs> right. the bugs you know because what happened to us is it was time to go out and harvest anemones um and we're out there first big harvest and every one of them is just covered in aphids on the bottom uh. and you know i've talked to many friends and many growers we all experience it and so what we're trying to do is mitigate some of that risk by helping you to be aware of um what, what to looking for. what what you're looking for and what to expect at some point um, it will happen and so um, you know a good business um, piece of advice that um, my husband Steve shared with me years ago when I was kind of ignoring a problem that was really obvious to him he said you know just because you ignore it does not mean it goes away yeah. <laughs> just because you are thinking you don't have bugs you're not educated enough to even scout and find pests um yeah so so their course um only enrolls once a year friends and it's in november it's actually november 19th through 23rd but the class doesn't start until january and it runs from january into february and if you're not familiar with our online courses once you purchase one of our courses, it's yours forever, just like a book. But instead of picking up the book, you just go to a device with internet, log in, and there's your course. Um, so that means if you're a beginner right now and you get in and start growing in a house and in two years you are facing a whole new disease problem, you get to go back into this course, go to the disease class six and think like, I know I heard something about this in here. And mm -hmm. because when it's not facing you, right, you don't even listen to that part. No, or, or you don't understand it. And, and so it doesn't, it doesn't click, you know? And right. yeah, I like so to read, true. I like to read, read books every once in a while and ones that I really liked and, and different things will click that I didn't even I didn't even remember what part of the part of the book, you know, so. exactly. Totally agree. So thank you guys so much for walking us down the ranunculus anemone possibilities. And um, friends, I'll put the link to get Gretel's PDF that lists, you know, the varieties, 
suppliers and some basic instructions um, so that you can get that from her. And when you request that, that puts you on their wait list for their course, which just means that any cool stuff like that that she makes for people that are interested in her course, you're going to get it, as well as we will tap you when registration opens. And um, so, friends, thanks so much. How can people connect with you guys on social media? Um, so we're Sunny Meadows Flower Farm on Instagram and now TikTok, too, um, and or on our website, sunnymeadowsflowerfarm.com. Um, and, yeah, we've got right now just cut right now cut flowers on the website but um to sell dahlia tubers in the fall and, and ranunculus and tulips uh in the late summers for fall shipping so okay. and we are we are shipping ranunculus right now so if anybody needs any cut need fresh flowers yeah yeah, fresh. Fresh. Oh, yeah 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 so if you've got events scheduled and yours isn't on time then that's that's kind of been our one of our um one of our biggest like audiences is kind of like growers who have booked events who maybe their timing didn't work out or they don't have the structures to, you know, get the quantity that they need um, for spring events. So, yeah, so we can show so it's to buying local early wedding. Yeah. You know, yeah. Basically. yeah. So that's awesome. And that's right. And you can learn more about all of that over on their website. All right, friends. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience. And until we meet again, friends. Bye. bye. See ya. Ciao, friends.